It's such a pleasure to be here. It's such an honor to be sandwiched between two celebratory, celebratory chefs. Um, when I read the topic today, communication and food, and I invited friends to come listen, some of them asked me, what does that mean? Well, I see that food is the way a society speaks about its attitude towards values in the world. Food, for me, equals life. Fuel is power. It's our fuel and our power. We can't live without it. We can live without a lot of things, but we cannot live without food. The, the institutional, the industrialization of food in uh, the United States and other industrial countries confuses us. It's what I just heard on a Jamie Oliver lecture uh, on another TED talk, because children don't recognize where food comes from. If you ask them where a carrot comes from or a potato, they'll say from the freezer or out of the box. They don't know. Now, children are honest, they'll tell you the truth. Many adults don't know either. It's the earth that provides us with food. Now, um, if our society is communicating this industrialization language about food, it's uh, for lack of respect of our ecosystem and honoring the earth. We need to re-examine our values. Her, um, Marcella's talk touched me deeply. Besides Earth, there's the other element that we need to learn more about and respect. It's the sun. The sun and the earth. The sun provides us so many solutions, and we just tend to ignore it. I'm going to be speaking about solar cooking as a as a natural, it's a natural resource that belongs to all of us equally. And it's a solution to the world's most pressing problems. Is it? It's a, it's a solution to the world's most pressing problems. All of you have heard of photo, all of you have heard of photovoltaic systems which convert solar energy to electricity. But Solar cookers are simpler. It's sort of the um, solar 101. The solar energy is converted to thermal energy or heat. Now, um, I have a solar cooker here, which I'd like to show you. I'm going to talk about it during my presentation. And I see uh, it's one model. There are many. It consists of a reflector and a pot. Still doing that. So this is um, a very simple portable panel cooker. This black pot is a steel enameled pot that absorbs light you put your food in there. It's inside of a soda lime glass bowl, and there's an air pocket between the two. So when it's in installed like this and the sun is up there, um, you will quickly reach cooking temperature inside of that pot. Uh, in, wa uh, it, in Washington, D.C., you can cook from April to about o October. Temperatures reach about 250 to 270 Fahrenheit. It was designed for the tropics where temperatures will go higher. It, it was actually designed for Mexico. <laughs> um, so let's go on a little journey here with my slides. Ah, my goal is to put a sun in every pot, especially in half in, in that half of the other half of the world that is um, living tremendous stress because biomass is diminishing. 
Three billion people in the world depend on biomass for cooking. I'm sure our um, Usman, who introduced me, knows this problem from his native Senegal. Those, it, it's as if I would divide the world into two. This group is the half that has to cook with biomass. This half gets to cook with all our fancy kitchen appliances. Um, it's unlikely that this half would have been able to make it to this presentation today because they'd still be busy looking for firewood. So um, I'd like to see a way to put a sun in every pot, especially in the sun-rich region of the world, which is around the equator, 20 degrees north and south of the equator. That's where the largest portion of these three billion people live. Oh. Ah. Here uh, is a, a, sh a scene that is um, prevalent all over the world, people collecting firewood. Um, I saw this myself when I lived in West Africa some years ago where I first recognized the need for some alternative, but I didn't know that there was any. Um, these, uh, this is a, a uh, difficult job looking for firewood. It looks sort of romantic because the picture is beautiful, but the head carrying is, is, is uh, damaging to your health and it's time consuming. And oftentimes mothers that are responsible for collecting firewood will take their daughters out with them because they can't carry enough on their heads. Now, this is a scene from Haiti uh, where firewood has been um, burned down into charcoal. It's even more devastating to the environment because you need seven to 10 times the amount of wood to produce charcoal. The reason charcoal is a desirable combustible is because when people live in small compounds in cities, um, you don't have room to store firewood. So charcoal is a better, um, it, it takes up less space and it also cooks longer and hotter. Here's a, a charcoal vendor um, in Haiti in a town that I just uh, returned from. Uh, now, he makes his income off of making charcoal and selling it. Um, if we shift over to solar cookers, which is something I'd like to see, or to more efficient cooking, he's going to lose his job. So we have to have him be able to do something that um, provides him an income. So I thought maybe we could teach him to solar cook and get him to sell solar cookers, too. Um, my organization is called Solar Household Energy. It's a nonprofit organization here located in Washington, D.C. We're part of a worldwide network of solar NGOs. We have a colleague who just arrived from Barcelona. Um, and I, I uh, look forward to seeing some of his uh, recent work. Um, he knows so well what I know. Now, here's a, a picture, uh, an aerial shot of Haiti, which maybe some of you have already seen. Uh, it's a NASA shot. It shows um, a very definite line between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, the trees have been removed. That means the topsoil most likely is gone as well. And the, the Haitians are crossing the border into the Dominican Republic to get the firewood they need. I, um, just so you know, an average family in the world that's reliant on firewood or biomass for cooking consumes, uh, consumes one ton a year. You can make, do the math of three, three billion peopi people consuming one ton of biomass a year. Here's how people cook with this biomass. This is a, a three stone fire. There are three stones in the middle of which uh, a pot is suspended. Now, this is traditional cooking, and I'm sure all of our ancestors cooked like this a few hundred years ago. But this is the 
type of cooking you'll still see in far too many parts of the world. The wire, that part of the world that I just described, 20 degrees north and south of the equator, where solar cooking is possible at least for one or two meals. If that family um, is cooking with firewood or charcoal and consuming that amount of wood, they could cut that consumption in half by using um, a solar cooker for one or two meals a day. This is, um, this is the next uh, slide that shows another problem. Among those three billion people, there are approximately uh, 100,000, 100 million growing that are experiencing what we call fuel famine. Let me describe that to you. Fuel famine means you have a dollar a day to spend on food or fuel. Now, for a woman in, I think this picture was taken in Kenya, for a mother in Kenya who has a dollar to spend on food or fuel, that charcoal in the middle costs the same amount of money that those eggs cost, or the same amount of money that that bag of cornmeal cost. So she will be distressed trying to figure out what to cook for her children and decide to buy less combustible, less charcoal, and cook food that cooks faster simply because she can't afford to buy enough of fuel to cook food that's more nutritious, like beans. This is um, a, a terrible dilemma. In recent years, um, Oh, now I can get to uh, the solar cooker. Here's the how to use the hot pot. I, I went over it very quickly, and I'll just say it again. Um, the, this particular model is a, para, is a uh, panel cooker. We designed it specifically uh, for people that have small living spaces uh, because of storage. And um, it functions um, like a crock pot. Uh, it's a slow cooker. Uh, the, it can cook just about anything. The only thing it cannot do, it cannot fry. Um, I uh, use it in my backyard. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C., three, three miles north of the White House, and I'm able to cook my vegetables, my, my stews, my meats, my beans, and I use it a lot to bake. It's a wonderful tool to bake, especially in the summer months when it's too hot to heat up your oven in Washington, D.C. So, uh, we, my organization, Solar Household Energy, the acronym is SHE, um, received funding from the World Bank Development Marketplace to introduce this, this particular cooker in uh, rural Mexico. Our partner organization in Mexico is Mexico Na Nature Conservancy Mexico. Um, and with their assistance, we, saw, we distributed this through NGOs in Mexico that already have environmental programs. Um, it, it was originally distributed to about eight states. Now it's in about 12 states of Mexico, most frequently in nature, nature reserves. This woman you see here, um, Teresa Martinez, she is advising her neighbors to go solar, uh, that she's so happy with it. She says, when there's good sunshine, I can cook my beans, my black beans, and I don't have to look, for, look at them twice. I just let it, let it sit out there, and it cooks on its own. Um, food won't burn uh, in, this, in this kind of solar cooker. You just let it be. Um, this is a picture of one of our trainers in Mexico. She's in Oaxaca. And she is, was already, before she started solar cooking, a gourmet cook very, very skilled, and she's become a master of cakes and everything else. Um, last spring, um, we ran a uh, pilot pro pro project in a refugee camp in Chad, where there are 21,000 refugees from Sudan with this very same model. Um, and the purpose was to see if this type of solar cooker would be accepted by the refugee women, uh, because there were three other camps in Chad that already had solar cookers that were made out of a less durable material. Um, so we're in a camp that has a very unusual name. Can you read it? It's called Gaga Camp. 
Uh, at first I thought it was Lady Gaga's camp, but apparently it's not. <laughs> anyway, we should find a way to let her know about it. <laughs> Uh, the lady in green is still carrying firewood on her head, and her sisters are telling her, put that down. You don't need to use that firewood anymore. Come over here and try this. It's firewood-free cooking. So uh, you see her over there, her green outfit. Um, teaching these very traditional ladies that look very fashionable with their beautiful clothing uh, is very difficult. I don't want to pretend that, a cult, that uh, behavior change is easy. It's not. It, it's like, um, why should I cook a different way from my mother? Uh, and, but the scarcity of wood in this area is so severe. Like, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees has to equip these families with firewood. But one month of firewood only lasts six days. So you get food. There's no food in refugee camps that you can eat raw. Everything needs to be cooked, everything. So those ladies that um, participated in this, in this pilot training um, were able to stretch their firewood, and it lasted 12 days. So they were so enchanted with uh, this saving of, of, of such a precious resource that they begged and pleaded that all of their families in the camp be provided with one of uh, a solar cooker. This is a location in the world where it's nearly 100 degrees every day and the sun is aggressive. You really have to go into the shade. Uh, it's ideal for solar cooking. Here's a little festival with the food that they cooked. They made their traditional toe and, and that for that particular day they managed to get some meat, which is a luxury. Um, I'm including a comic that was uh, sent to me by a refugee youth um, where he's describing better than I can what it's all about. Masi, you mean that cardboard in the other refugee camps they were cooking with a cardboard reflector? You mean that cardboard can cook without fire? Of course, solar cooking is good for us and good for the planet. You know I hate smoke. There's no smoke to injure the eyes or cause respiratory problems. Or people who are allergic to smoke can now enjoy, this is a great word, can now enjoy solar cues. <laughs> he invented that word instead of barbecues. <laughs> uh, I just got back from Haiti last week. I was. Um, I had a contract, or my organization had a contract with Nature Conservancy of the Dominican, Dominican Republic that wanted to encourage people living along the border. This is not in the stressed area of Haiti. This is not where the earthquake, earthquake happened. This is on the border. These people are really isolated. They, um, so they're, it's peaceful. Uh, but it's a big village uh, without electricity or water and the people are encroaching on the Dominican side to collect firewood, and oftentimes there's clandestine charcoal making on the Dominican side because you can't see where the border is. And there's just no way you can put enough police surveillance to, to check that out. So um, I uh, was, went down there to do a pilot program, and uh, people got a different kind of cooker than this one. It's called a box cooker, and we selected it because it can take a larger pot. Families are quite large. Uh, this pot is only five liters, and we managed to put an 11 liter pot in there, which was a, a significant um, improvement if you have 10 people to feed. Um, so this is one of her first meals. After our training in one location, everyone took their solar cooker home and uh, prepared food for their families. Here are um, some of the people that were in the training. Uh, and the surprise on their faces is because this was the very first time they saw anything cooked in a solar oven and that rice came out steaming hot and they were just like, their eyes were popping out. Um, since you can't use solar ovens at night or when it's inclement weather, programs should bring in another type of cooking technology that's more efficient. and this thing you see there that looks like a paint can is called a fuel-efficient stove. 
It's a fuel efficient stove by design by one of the colleagues of this new Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves uh, that you're probably going to hear more about from Jose Andres. Um, it is uh, got a rocket elbow in there, which means that it produces smoke when you fire it up, but then the smoke is supposed to burn completely so that you're not um, you're going to have the problem with the traditional three stone fire where people are uh, breathing the equivalent of two packs of cigarettes a day of smoke. Uh, and these people are really happy to get a solar cooker and a fuel efficient stove. I'm going to be returning there in three months uh, to see how they have managed and if they're still using them and if they're in good condition. So um, I'm coming back to Washington. This is my claim to fame as almost being a solar chef. Not quite, it's sort of the little league, but I did make the Washington Post food section 10 years ago, when before this existed, and uh, I'm quite happy with this article. <clears throat> In Washington, D.C., uh, we had a snowstorm last year uh, that I'm sure those that live here remember. Um, and I, this is a picture um, of a friend of mine who had a power outage, and uh, she wasn't the only one. Uh, and she decided, the sun is so gorgeous, I'm just going to go out there and bake a cake. Uh, and, <laughs> and she did. She's a professional pastry chef. <laughs> and she's become our most skilled um, cook, solar cooker in Washington, D.C. Uh, so this is, um, be, be aware, I'd like to alert all of you to know that as an emergency tool, there's nothing better than having a solar cooker. Um, it handy and you don't need to buy one you can make your own um, there are uh, a lot of green schools uh, in the area now and I get invited to speak about my um, work internationally and I was recently in this school in Northwest DC um, they're fifth graders and they're learning the principles of solar cooking and they each uh, divided up into teams and built invented and built solar cookers and then they went on the rooftop of the school and um, had a, a solar, a solar cook-off. And the um, solar cooker that got the highest temperature got the highest hot dog. <laughs> One. Now, their teacher, after hearing me sp speak and mentioning the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, she said, that the children would all write a letter to the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. So 60 kids wrote a letter, and I would just like to read you one to end my talk. Dear Global Alliance at the UN Foundation, my name is Hassan. I'm in grade five. I'm asking that you start using solar ovens. Solar ovens will keep you safe from fires and explosions. Food, uh, unlike fire cookers, solar ovens don't even need firewood. So that saves trees, which also helps by sucking up carbon dioxide. Plus, these ovens can even be used over and over again. When I was first introduced to solar ovens, I thought they weren't worth a thing. Man, I was wrong. Solar ovens cook just like fire ovens, except they're better. They're safe, and they make food taste great. And plus that, they're efficient. What's better than that? Nothing. So what you waiting for? Go make one and enjoy. <laughs>